Hello traders, it is Saturday, December the 21st. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com, here with a different type of video. I don't want to do a wrap-up and forecast for next week because the next week is going to be holiday-stricken, meaning it's going to be very thinly uh, liquid, uh, very likely to be very quiet. On the other hand, if uh, certain uh, developments uh, come across the wires, that same thin liquidity can also lead to extraordinary volatility, but erratic type of volatility. Not really great trading conditions uh, and really not a uh, scenario or environment, at least I feel comfortable in trying to pick off small trades uh, because what movement you will get is going to be very difficult to plan out uh, properly. So instead, for this weekend video, I want to talk about uh, an outlook into 2020 uh, particularly the beginning of 2020, but we can also infer uh, throughout the entirety of the year, uh, more along the lines of what the top risk is for each of the major currencies, uh, but also a couple of the major asset classes. Uh, I want to talk about what the top themes are, and some of them will be similar. Trade wars, for example, recessionary fears. Those are going to be fairly similar across those uh, variable issues, but we will talk about each one just so that you have perhaps better insight on the top uh, fundamental themes one way or the other. All right. But before we dive into that conversation, if you could just take a quick look, 10 seconds uh, at the risk disclaimer, then uh, we can dive right into it. Okay, so the first place I want to start is actually in the FX world. So the US dollar is arguably one of the more complicated of the major uh, currencies. Now, when I'm talking about the uh, key catalysts or fear risks, risk can be a positive or a negative. Uh, most of us just think of it as in the negative connotation, but a risk is something that could actually drive it higher. Uh, a higher currency is not always a benefit to uh, all those that track it. Just ask the U.S. President Donald Trump, who does not, does not like the higher dollar. It makes, uh, combined with uh, U.S. federal monetary policy, uh, very difficult to conduct a trade war without stymieing the economy in a very uh, clear way. Now, that doesn't necessarily make it a issue. I think one of the most remarkable things about the dollar, and I talk about this in the fundamental version of the forecast for the US dollar, which I wrote for the first quarter alongside James Stanley, who wrote the technicals, uh, that the congestion that you see here is the most extraordinary thing about the currency. It is some of the most restrained price action we've seen from this currency in history. And it cannot last. Eventually, inevitably, it will see a surge, but the surge or the commitment to one direction or the other, bullish or bearish, really depends on what ultimately takes precedence. And that is a difficult thing to uh, pick apart. The reason that it is congested is because it is unclear about what's most important. Is it a safe haven or is it a carry currency? Is it a uh, fundamental advantage in the US economy outpacing some of its larger counterparts like Europe or certain parts of Asia? Uh, or is this a reflection of the monetary policy regime of the Fed and, and the, the fact that it has more uh, capacity to, to uh, ease if necessary? Ultimately, I think that the principal catalyst for the US dollar is probably going to orient back towards risk. Now, risk on, risk off, this is an ultimate safe haven if you're talking about panic. If you're talking about a, an absolute full tilt, full scale risk aversion, the US dollar becomes one of the very few things that can absorb that degree of panic. But the intensity of such a severe risk aversion uh, is going to be difficult to climb up to. I know it's been quiet for far too long. Uh, you look at something like the VIX, and yes, it is extremely uh, uh, compact, and it can blow up. But the probability that you transition from extreme quiet to exceptional volatility like you did, let's say, back in February 2018 uh, is not that easy to do. Now, I'll keep open the possibility that it does occur, but instead, it, the interim period of risk aversion, just where a moderate trickle-down risk aversion, will probably stir something like a slowdown in economic activity for the U.S., uh, as well as a uh, commensurate move from the Fed to ease. 
If you do look at the easing of the Fed, uh, the Fed's monetary policy, you can see that uh, actually that's, uh, that's the opposite. Uh, it does align fairly nicely to the performance of the U.S. dollar. This is the expectations for 2020. Now, all of this obviously has a connotation to risk trends. All right, if it's mild risk aversion, the dollar is likely to, to fall. If it's intense, severe, blind panic, the dollar is likely to rise. The decline would be more consistent as a trend. The rise would be more abrupt, more severe, but not last as long. So watch risk trends for the dollar to finally clear up one of the most convoluted of the fundamental pictures in the major, uh, not just the major currencies, but the uh, major financial system. Now, the second most liquid currency, the euro. All right. The euro is made difficult by its U.S. counterpart. It is not clear uh, it, what the euro is doing relative uh, to the U.S. dollar because the U.S. dollar can be uh, very influential. You can see this is actually a mirror of the DXY. In part, that's because the DXY is heavily weighted towards the euro USD, but the euro, being the second most liquid currency, adopts a lot of what the U.S. dollar does. Uh, however, if we look at an equally weighted euro index, this is what you get. So the euro is fading, but it is not fading as progressively and near the lows as it has been uh, when uh, you look at the euro USD. So what is the most uh, pr fundamentally motivating thing for the euro? Well, there's a number of things here. The, the, the European economy is uh, generally lagging uh, some of its major counterparts. Uh, you also have uh, exposure to risk trends and local risks, including uh, likely a, re a retooling of Italy, the ongoing pressure with the UK and the, and the EU's Brexit divorce. But I really think that the most uh, principal thing here to watch is going to be monetary policy oriented. Uh, that is going to be the ECB. This will slowly start to erode the euro's conviction. Why? Because the ECB has been one of the most aggressive easing central banks. It has gone all in with restoring its QE efforts and cutting rates to even further in negative territory. Light blue is the ECB's balance sheet. This has in turn led to a diminished capacity for effectiveness in monetary policy, meaning if there is a crisis, the central bank will probably not be able to, uh, to quell the, the fear and prevent uh, problems in the financial so system's operation. Now, there is one alternative where this becomes a much more direct, much more focused issue, uh, and that is trade wars. Uh, most of the trade wars conversation has been U.S. and China. For good reason, that's where it's been most, uh, most productive in a negative way. But the U.S. and EU are starting to get into a very explicit uh, trade-off of, of tariffs. We have a few uh, tariffs from the U.S. on the EU's imports, and that's uh, owing to principally the WTO. But there's also France, who has slapped the digital tax on large uh, tech companies, which the U.S. takes as a hit to the United States. And there is uh, still a th the threat, and I don't think it's necessarily fully up to speed, uh, but it is definitely looming, uh, a, a counter or a response to uh, that digital tax. This could easily escalate, and if it is, two largest economies in the world, and the euro, like the Chinese yuan, uh, this past couple of years, will probably take the brunt of the impact. The dollar is not, it's not like the U.S. does better because of it, uh, but the dollar being more liquid by an, a, a factor of three uh, will probably draw a lot more of that liquidity away from the euro. The euro would take a hit. Now, there's nothing that says this has to happen, uh, and in the absence of that escalation, I'll revert back to monetary policy concerns, uh, but keep that very close in mind. Now, speaking of monetary policy, there is no one, uh, with the exception of the Swiss National Bank, which I won't talk about the franc, uh, but the then the Bank of Japan, who has lost credibility as a monetary policy authority. They have been pursuing uh, policy, not just in this recent cycle, since really 2012, um, that has been designed to help revive inflation, bolster growth, but also to manipulate the, the exchange rate. They admitted to it for a brief period and then were rebuked by the G7, and they backtracked on that. But it's quite clear that they're attempting to uh, lever their capital markets higher and, and devalue their currency. But they are not 
capable of doing so. So monetary policy, as important as it is, especially the recognition that it is ineffective, ooh, if this is a risk that spreads to the rest of the world, we have a problem. But for the Japanese yen, this is the dollar yen, and it's very much a, a situation here, this is true of the dollar yen, but more so for all of the yen crosses, it is a, a measure of risk trends. So if risk aversion is to kick up, the yen crosses would drop. If risk appetite is to charge forward, the yen crosses will rise. In terms of uh, where it stands relative to other risk-based assets, carry trade is way down here in the orange. Here it is on uh, just a more timely basis from December 1st, 2018. You can see it's underperforming other risk-oriented assets. Now, when liquidity is restored, if risk appetite continues into 2020, early 2020, which I have a poll running to see what people in FinTwit uh, believe, uh, but and that'll be a, a video for next week, um, then the yen crosses, carry trade, will be a discount relative to that, that bid on risk appetite trends. However, if risk aversion were to kick in, these yen crosses would still decline. It'd be beneficial, advantageous to look for uh, yen crosses that are higher, that can take a bigger hit, or are more explicitly exposed to, to unique aspects of the risk aversion. Uh, the Aussie yen is definitely uh, one that can uh, take a clear hit. Dollar yen is also, is probably one of my favorite, uh, it's included in my top trades, uh, and that's because the US dollar is a carry currency, and it's uh, coming slowly under pressure because of the Fed's easing off of its hawkish policy bearing. All right. But risk trends is the number one concern that I have when it comes to trading yen crosses. So keep tabs on sentiment. For the British pound, it's quite simple. Uh, when you're talking about the sterling, whether it's the pound dollar, the euro pound, uh, or if you want to, since we're already on this course, if you want to look at all the pound uh, crosses and look at them in an equally weighted index, uh, the the question is going to be brexit now i know brexit's not it's not immediately at hand but after the uk election it's clear that boris johnson is pushing for a cap to a transition period the decision the withdrawal agreement um it was the big unknown until after the election uh, and that comes on january the 31st a date to mark in your diary uh, and then the end of the transition period as it originally stand, stands is uh, December, end of December 2020. Now this is a long time out, so you'd say, well, maybe this fundamental theme would diminish in terms of importance, but it won't. Um, it's a considerable amount of uncertainty. Now this won't necessarily lead to a clear drive for the sterling bullish or bearish, but it will create a sense of great uncertainty. So keep this in mind. Uh, know that uh, yeah, you should be watching things like UK employment statistics as the as the, uh, the year unfolds, uh, Bank of England intent, uh, and uh, other localized economic indicators. But it's really still about Brexit, going on uh, more than three years now. All right, so no meaningful change there, at least from my perspective, of what the top fundamental issue is and where my analysis will always start. It'll be what's going on with Brexit today. Now, one more currency I want to cover. I won't cover all of the currencies, um, but it's the Australian dollar. Here, it's fairly straightforward. There are a couple issues here. Growth, uh, relative risk trends. This is a carry currency, but it has diminished in its capacity. A lot of what it reflects is now focused much more on its relationship to trade wars, uh, but more so uh, to China specifically. China doesn't have to always be directed by trade wars, but it often is uh, uh, recently. So this is the uh, CNH USD. So this is Chinese Yuan over the US dollar. Usually we look at it as the US dollar Chinese Yuan, so we flipped it upside down. And as you can see, this has a very strong correlation to the Oz USD. Now, a lot of people have a problem with the changing the USD CNH, and that's because they believe that it's manipulated uh, by policy officials, and there's good reason to believe that. Actually, I think that, that confers a, a separate uh, unique benefit, uh, but that's also something I talk about in, the, in my top opportunities uh, uh, write-up. But the Aussie USD is definitely a trade war focus or a USD CNH focus. 
Now, trade wars may continue to soften if that's indeed the case. AusUSD is probably going to lift. Why? Because it benefits China. The pressure is, is relaxed, and Australia has inextricably uh, connected itself to the health of China. Uh, the, the buoy to China would buoy the Australian economy and the Australian dollar, and vice versa. All right, so trade wars and general, but China specifically is what you should be looking at when it comes to the Australian dollar. Uh, and this is, uh, since I've been doing it with the other currencies, an equally weighted Aussie dollar index is very similar to just the Aussie USD. Clearly, this is a theme that permeates all of its, its crosses. Putting aside the currencies for a minute, uh, the perspective of capital markets, the S&P 500 is a benchmark for risk, uh, or sorry, a benchmark for global equities. You could look at something like the ACWI, but realistically, the S&P 500 as a, uh, a pace setter, this is the S&P 500 relative to the rest of world equities, the VEU ETF. I look at this pretty frequently. And this is the weekly index of that ratio. Clearly, the US, benchmark is outperforming. Now, this would suggest that it's a poor representation of global equities. There's very different pictures for DAX. There's very different pictures for FTSE, Nikkei, Aussie, ASX, uh, MIB. They, they have different shapes and different relative uh, heights. But the S&P 500 is one of the better measures for global equities because it is that leader. And if this particular index, which has been doing so well, were to start to slip, it would be an indication that there is there must be a genuine risk aversion. If it is at the peak of performance in just the past 12 months, the peak of performance since the recovery started after the great financial crisis, then its capitulation would be a serious problem. Alternatively, if the rest of the world, or if the US equities continue to carry on when liquidity is restored for 2020, then it's probably going to reinforce and encourage uh, some catch-up from other risk-based assets. So from an equities perspective, it's not that I would like the S&P 500 to the upside. If there is a bullish outcome with risk on, sentiment is the key factor for me here, then I will be looking for relative global equity indices at a discount, but at similar advantage economically speaking, and well, yield really doesn't uh, factor in here, people are really just chasing momentum. But if they continue to chase momentum, they're going to find corollaries that are cheaper, much like how uh, when gold's in a truly uh, progressive and consistent bull trend, people will increasingly go to silver because it's a cheaper alternative, and they just want to ride the wave through that proxy. If it's risk aversion, no one has more to fall than the U.S. indices. But risk general sentiment, the basis of, uh, of the markets, and uh, speculative appetite. That is where I'll be looking when it comes to equities. Now, in terms of commodities, uh, we do have uh, a very interesting picture for crude, but very simplistic here, it's growth. U.S., particularly but global in general, growth is, is what you're be, you will be looking for. There is a sensitivity to risk trends. There's a correlation to the benchmarks like S&P 500, obviously much more restrained, but the outlook for economic growth is where much of this comes from. And that's the demand side, not the supply side. A lot of supply-based uh, updates, but they fail to do more than shake a little bit of volatility intraday. If you're looking for a, a true trend and a significant swing, it usually comes and aligns to issues that, uh, that really project fears over growth accelerating or decelerating. Fairly straightforward. Although a lot of convolution uh, because people are looking for something that can finally just shake it out of this wedge. It will find its way out of this wedge, but that's probably going to be due to a, a, a really truly uh, significant shift in the expectations for growth going forward. Gold. Gold is one of the most important assets in in my radar, in my normal review. And it's not because I intend to take a trade. I really haven't trade, uh, traded this uh, instrument a lot, whether outright or derivative. But I use it all the time in cross-checking other trades that I take. This is a safe haven of very particular type. This is a safe haven that really talks about financial stability or instability. If gold continues to rise, 
yet volatility, imply volatility from something like the VIX, which people consider the fear indicator. So if fear is presumably declining, S&P 500 is rising, but gold continues to increase, that tells me that it is not a genuinely uh, equally distributed sentiment. That is not true risk appetite. Why? Because why would you otherwise want to take advantage of gold, which has zero yield, zero capital market value? This is a safe haven of very particular sort. Now, it's probably pushed up because it is a reflection of devalued or diminished value uh, via uh, things like the dollar and treasuries and euro and boons and uh, pound and uh, and gilts and, and essentially the representation of countries and their assets and their currencies. As that devalues, sure, you can keep capital markets buoyant. The central banks have been doing a very good job at that. Problem is that collectively, as these central banks devalue their local assets, and uh, many people on the conspiracy side think that that's to uh, essentially deflate their, their debt away, uh, regardless, eventually that scheme would end uh, in the terms of its effectiveness, and the markets, just being simply too large, will eventually collapse under that weight. So the principal theme that I'm looking at here is not risk trends. It's actually the perspective of how confident are the markets in the world's uh, police, monetary police, fi fiscal police, uh, financial police. If that diminishes, then you're going to see not just risk aversion. Risk aversion will come, but it's going to be fear of instability, and that is financial seizure. And that would push gold up as one of the very few places to put, park money uh, that you have left. They, they would be moving out of risk-based assets like equities. Uh, they would f try to find safety, but the traditional safety assets like government bonds are being devalued because of these really extreme monetary policy efforts, which will be uh, diminished even further because of central banks' response for, at their already low bound. So it actually comes back to monetary policy. But of course, there are a number of catalysts that can uh, bolster that influence along the way. All right. So this is an overview of some of the key markets that I follow on a regular basis from a global macro tot uh, holistic basis. And this is what I'm going to be focusing on as my top fundamental theme for 2020 for each of them. Can it change? Absolutely. Things will change inevitably. But as it stands right now, as we head into the new trading year, this is what stands most principally as the thing that can change not just tempo, so whether gold goes uh, from congestion to a trend or stays in congestion, dollar, whether it does so, uh, or direction. All right. So do this type of a top-down analysis. Uh, there's always a time, uh, there's always time that we should take, put aside, and say, what's my big picture look? We do it on the technicals. We should also do it on the fundamentals. All right. So do this analysis yourself. You might disagree. That's fine. Uh, just have a reasoning why, and make sure that you operate with this in mind when you go back to the day-to-day -day trades. Uh, when we get back into the weeds, you at least can remember the, the general picture of the environment you're navigating. All right, we'll wrap it up here. I hope you have a great weekend. I'll do some more videos next week. They'll be fewer and they will not be daily, but they'll be more uh, longer term, big picture uh, orientation. Uh, until we speak again, I wish you all good luck trading out there.